Hello and welcome back to the channel with a slightly new version of what we were doing before, this new formatted show. Hopefully a regular show that you're going to enjoy with lots of uh, loose bits of bits and bobs of information and fun and thrills. That's the idea of the show. Now you'll notice that we've rebranded it. It was formerly called Afternoon Tea and then I was doing some at the weekend called Morning Coffee. But the plan now is to call it Made in England because it is about England and Englishness and all that sort of stuff and I want to funnel that into one show that you can enjoy and you'll get a grip of. I think what we were doing was confusing the audience with all the different names and all the different stuff so this is an afternoon show plan is that it'll go out at the afternoon in the weekdays at about four-ish between four and six UK time uh, and it's about England and Englishness and it's called Made in England and here's our opening titles. <laughs> So hello, I'm Richard Vobes, and this is the first of this new format. Let's hope it. Uh, this let's hope there's no more changes. First of all, which would be rather jolly and nice. Um, anyway, so there we go. That was uh, that's our opening titles. Thank you very much for joining. Um, I just heard, just as we were getting to go to record on the news, the sad news, the sad news that uh, dear Leslie Phillips, 98 years old, uh, stalwart of comedy, theatre and, uh, of course, film, as we remember from the carry-ons, has sadly died. There he is, uh, 98 years of age, a British icon, I think, an, an English actor. And uh, I believe I've got a little bit of information here uh, sourced from the old Wikipedia, of course. Leslie Phil Phillips, born on the 20th of April 1924 and has died yesterday, the 7th of November 2022. English actor, voice artist and author. Um, I remember him, of course, best for Doctor in the House, the Carry On films and numerous British comedies. So it's very sad to see another of those icons of comedy, particularly English icons, disappearing. Um, they don't make them like they used to. And I remember one of his lines in one of the Carry Ons where he played a character called Dr Bell. And the nurse says as he comes in, Dr Bell, ding dong, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Leslie Phillips. So we, we mourn the passing of him, and so that's very sad. I also would like to say I mourn the passing of a viewer of mine, a long-time viewer, Charles Stell, who, when I started The Vogue Show many, many years ago in 2005... Um, he was a stalwart of the show, he used to email in very often good old Charles Stell from Arkansas in uh, Amity, I think it was, a little piney woods and a little place called Amity. And my friend at the time, Jimmy and I, went over to see him in 2006 as part of our American tour. And we stayed in the uh, in the uh, in his um, trailer. He it was an interesting, curious thing. He lived in this trailer with a with a little factory or storage unit next to him, and then the, another which looked like a, an overgrown kennel. I know, I kid you not. And he used to go in there. It was sort of designed like an overgrown kennel. It was very bizarre. Very lovely chap. Uh, him and his wife, Brandy. And they they looked after us for one night as we did our tour in America, podcasting to the globe under the Vogue Show banner. And um, it, they were lovely. But sadly, Charles and Brandy, in fact, passed away about five or six years ago, maybe longer. Um, and Charles had been going on. He, he was 73, I think. So it's no age to go. So today's show is dedicated to good old Charles, who's been with us all that time. So there we are. You're listening. You're watching the, the new branded Made in England with me, Richard Vobes. <laughs> And thank you so much for uh, joining us. So, right, oops, now, let me see if I can get myself all together. As you know, this show is recorded as if it's live. It's not actually going out live as a live stream for various different reasons, but it is actually recorded as if it's live, so you, you may see a few mistakes and bits and bobs. As I've mentioned in the past, I have gizmos on the desk, which I try to play so bits and bobs come in. Uh, but we're going to start with your emails and photos first, because as you know, uh, I was talking 
talking about my kitchen and I was encouraging you, and which is one of the things we want to do is encourage the audience to send in pictures of their relevant things to stuff that we talk about. So we've been talking about kitchens and fires and they are very much in the uh, in the vein of what we are. Whoops, that's the that's the webcam. There we are. See, I just pressed the wrong button. It's so easy to do. Um, so I want to have a look at some of your emails and we're going to start with Richard, whose email is, he says, um, the, oh, hang on. This was about eggs. I did write a note that this is all going terribly wrong. <laughs> It's all going terribly wrong. Uh, you may remember we also talked about eggs. And in one of my vlogs, I was uh, at, in the last show or the last but one show, going through a Delia Smith book. And she was giving us this indication of you can put eggs into the bottom of a jug of water and it will lie in a certain way and tell you whether it's good. But Richard got in touch. Thank you. I've got back on form now. Richard got in touch. He says, uh, actually, he says, by use... Uh, the but before use by dates, people would check if their eggs were fresh by rattling them, especially uh, when buying them from trays in the street market. As an egg ages, the air gap gets bigger and you can feel the egg moving in its shell. The stronger the movement, the older the egg. My mum worked in a grocer's during the war and they would check all their egg deliveries this way. Cheers from Richard. So there we go. Now, I did go downstairs. I thought I had a single egg left over, but actually we had omelettes the other day or scrambled egg, whatever it was, and I used them up and I need to go and purchase some more. So I can't do the rattling of the egg myself, which I very much wanted to do on the show, by the way, but uh, not to worry. Right, <clears throat> excuse me. Right, next email. This is from Margaret. And Margaret says, Hi, Richard, I have loads to send of my old house. I lived here for 77 years. Watch you every day, like everything you do. Loads of photos of the house, says Margaret. So let us go and have a look at uh, Margaret's house now, because she did, as I say, she sent in these wonderful pictures. So uh, we're going to go back and um, have a look here. So this is... Um, I guess in her part of her kitchen, which looks absolutely lovely. I love the stone pots and all these jugs at the top here. Can we zoom in a bit? Look at that. And uh, there's a stuffed animal. And you'll see a few more of those in a minute. Uh, I love these stone pots and all that earthenware and these old cupboards. I think it's absolutely fantastic, uh, Margaret. Um, we have four of these pictures. Now, in your above the fire, I assume is. I hope you can see that. That is a picture of a moose. At least I hope it's a moose. I think she's got a name for it. Can't remember off the top of my head what it was called. Um, and there are more here. Stuffed heads. Now, this isn't everybody's cup of tea, I grant you. Um, fox. Um, is that a weasel at the top? A badger, a hare and a rabbit as well. Fantastic. Um, I always think that the old joke that you go around the other side of the wall and you would see the rest of the animals sticking out. Um, have you got this kind of stuff? And finally, in her living room, a beautiful fire. Let's just zoom in here and see if we can see a bit more of that on the go with all the lovely ironmongery on the walls. So uh, thank you very much uh, for, for that. Uh, absolutely fantastic isn't it it's amazing it's we are nosy people aren't we we do like to have a look inside other people's houses and see what's there certainly like to to have a look at that now we've just looked at a fire and uh mark has got a fire he sent in a picture of his fire let's have a look at that his fire is a very different very swish like your room there but i'm going to zoom in on your fire look at that isn't that swish and um now I, I always, you know, there's baskets of wood there. There's always in my fire a lot of uh, sparks and bits of wood and various things on my kitchen floor. But I noticed that, uh, Mark, you have absolutely nothing, um, which is totally remarkable, I have to say. I don't know how you manage that personally, but uh, there you go. And uh, so that's really interesting. So thank you for that, Mark. Uh, Susan has three pictures of her fireplace, but she has an email to go with it. So let's just uh, see if I can find, um, that's the webcam again, uh, <laughs> see if I can find her email. So we're looking for Susan's email and she says, um, have I got these round the wrong way? It says, morning Richard, I'm including photos of my fireplace, which you may also find interesting. The traditional stove shape 
one is in the back living room and the slate surround, the one with the wood grain finish and tiles, are original to the house, which was built in 1906. The stove was bought about 20 years ago and is an SE. At the time, it was uh, available as solid fuel, wood burner or gas. This is the gas version. We'll have a look in a second. Uh, she goes on the cylindrical shaped one is in the front living room, which is which has the original slate surround and tiles. The fender is also original to the house. The stove also purchased about 20 years ago is, French, is a French made Godin. It also has a gas burner. The red one is an SE electric heater and is in the bedroom. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Well, we will do our best on that. So I think we should go and have a look at those. Uh, that was um, Mark's. So here we go. Look at this. Beautiful. I love the uh, the house. You've got all these wonderful old bits of memorabilia in there. I mean, you've got the fire, of course, and you've got a cat on the mantelpiece, that beautiful old clock there, a wind-up clock, presumably. Lots of interesting things. And on that side there, a bit of coloured grass glass rather and a lovely old mat so uh, S susan these are absolutely amazing let's have a look at the the next picture um and look at this this is the godin fire look at that isn't that beautiful and and it's so stunning it is so stunning you make me absolutely jealous it's so beautiful these old houses i mean they're just you you can't beat them can you i know people don't like this sort of stuff some people they just want modern stuff but that is amazing. And this is the last one. And I believe you said this is also an SE. Look at that, the detail on that fire. Isn't that beautiful? Love all your little cats, uh, stuffed cats. And the marble, is that real marble or is that wood? It looks like a marble finish with lovely tiles. How beautiful is that? 1906, original to the house. That is um, absolutely stunning and um, I love it. I think that's that's amazing. Thank you so much um, for sharing that, Susan. And not to be outdone, Ver uh, Veronica has sent in five pictures of her kitchen. This is, this is just incredible. So let's have a look. Five pictures of your kitchen. Um, let me just get that lined up. So here we go. This is Veronica's kitchen. It's small, so I can see if I can blow this up. Beautiful old kitchen. Look at that. The um, the plate rack, very nice, much posher than mine, of course. And all these bits and pieces stuck on the walls. But the sink, by a uh, Belfast sink, I should say, like the black and white check there. And these beautiful pots with the blue and white stripe, absolutely stunning part of your kitchen. Um, and a modern fireplace, uh, sorry, a modern cooker. Presumably that's gas, it looks like, with the lovely green. Lots going on in there. Um, and those beautiful pots. It's very, very homely. I do like that. Um, and this is looking out over towards the window. A different area where you can wash up with a, which, which looks like a stainless sink there. But um, and I love the scales. Look at these scales over here. They're like the Avery scales that you used to see in the uh, butchers and the sweetie shop where they would measure out. And of course. Um, this sort of mixing bowl how delightful that is so nice thank you so much uh two more pictures here um on the other side got, got your toaster but all more of those um blue and white striped jugs there's probably a name for that design isn't there, there probably is a name for it that all of these things i'm discovering a name you've got little curtains there but a gingham curtain down there and some english uh, union flags love it and the final picture here we go. She says she went for a cafe feel. And uh, it's lovely. Look, cash only. There we are. All these cakes going on in her kitchen. That does look like a lovely swish cafe. Caf cafe, if I can get the words out. Um, that's marvellous. Thank you so much for sharing that. that. Isn't that lovely? That's wonderful. Brilliant stuff. Um, and if you want to send in any pictures of yours, uh, to keep them coming. We will try and show them in the show. But we'll move on and we'll be looking at other things as well. Fabulous. Right. So uh, it's time to move on from all of this excitement, ladies and gentlemen, for you may remember Julia was uh, demonstrating tele talking about her ukulele and her music. Well, she's got a different uh, musical object in this sequence of stuff where Julia talks about her music and her uh, passion.
um, for her instruments. And she's going to be putting a lot of these footage that we are sharing here onto her YouTube channel. Once she's got that up and running a bit better, we'll share you the link because she's going to be operating her own YouTube channel. Um, and, and of course, you'd be desperate for an audience like the rest of us are. And so I'll give you the links all on that. But meanwhile, let's find out what she is playing in the sequence of Julia and her music. <laughs> So uh, I just got to find where it is. I think she is uh, just in the process of getting it all tuned up. Yeah, I've tried to tune this, but um, I don't have any of the gadgets that I would normally have used for it. I, with my ukulele, it's quite easy enough to tune by ear, which I usually do using a YouTube video, <laughs> funny enough. Um, so thank you. I think it's Ruben, the person who does that. But I spoke last time about my quarter-sized violin that I began to learn on all those years ago, or should I say began to kill all those years ago. And I have tried to tune it just now, but um, by ear, and it's already sliding out of uh, tune. But it's not actually, they call it quarter-sized, but it's not actually a quarter of a full-sized violin. It's actually more like 86% Oh no, that the half size violin is 86% of a full size violin. So I'm not sure what that would make this. I'm not very great on maths. But um, it's, be it's beautiful and it's tiny and it's cute and I think it's adorable. But it's interesting to see it laid or standing next to my ukulele. <laughs> I'd gotten so used to the size of the ukulele and thought, yep, yep, that's such a small, small stringed instrument. I love it so much. It's, uh, you know, you can take it anywhere. Of course, my violin, original, original violin, was much smaller. Now, where had I got to in the story? I think I'd started telling you about the, I'd told you about the mandolin, hadn't I? Um, which, because of my earlier training, training <laughs> on my violin, meant that I was able to understand the mandolin a bit better. Mandolin is much harder an instrument because it has double strings on each of the tuned notes. Now the violin is tuned G, D, A, E, um, the same as the uh, mandolin. So the G would be two strings and D two strings, A two strings, etc, etc. Um, so you've got to manage to cover both of them as well as forming, you know, the chords and things like that. Quite tricky. So although I love it, I haven't picked it up for a few years um, and the ukulele has definitely taken um, special place over that. But whilst I, um, whilst I was uh, practicing with my mandolin to start with in the, the studio at the Teapot Junkies headquarters, um, <clears throat> my, um, I'd, I went and dug out my little violin and I'd started practicing on it as well and trying to tune it up. And my grandmother, my mum's mum, had, uh, had um, heard, overheard me like, playing with it. And uh, so she said, actually, I've still got a violin somewhere. My jaw dropped, my ears pricked. I was like, sorry now, what did, did you say you've got a violin? She's like, yeah, since when? He's like, well, I've had it for a long time. It was my grandfather's handed down from his father and grandfather before that. So, I mean, it's got to be a hundred years old at least. Um, I must get it valued at some point and looked at and, and things like that. But, um, and I will dig it out and I'll show you at some point. It is a beauty and it does sound lovely. I'll kill your ears for just a split moment, but. So that's a, a very weedy little sound. It happens to be the highest note uh, string on the violin anyway, but so it's got a weedy sound, but this, this other violin, this older violin, a full sized one, um, it has a much deeper resonance and it sounds lovely. Um, now that's the, the nicest violin I've ever played. Um, I have no idea what brand or maker it is, but I, I look forward to showing you that next time perhaps. So thank you for listening and uh, hope I didn't kill your ears too much. Are they bleeding? Sorry about that. Good old Julia. We'll be seeing more of Julia and uh, we'll continue this um, series about Julia and her instruments and how she gets on, of course. And we'll see a bit more of Julia later on in the show.
Now, another thing that I wanted to bring into the show and uh, talk about, uh, because it's made in England, is something that I think is very crucial to the English psyche, uh, certainly uh, in, my, in my world, is old English films. And we mentioned at the beginning the sad news that Leslie Phillips had died. Now, I had, didn't know that before we set up. And uh, sometimes what Julia and I do of an evening is we will go and find some of these old iconic films and, and watch them. Julia often hasn't seen them, and I haven't seen them for such a long time, that it's, um, it's very nice to go and remember these things of a, of a former time. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm passionate about an England that I feel I've lost. One of those was a film called The Blue Lamp with Jack Warner. Now, I don't know if you remember that. It was The film sparked off, I believe, the TV series Dixon of Doc Green. And I've got some uh, stills here. Now, I've got to try and uh, get into the uh, relevant place. Here we go. The Blue Lamp, made at Ealing Studios in London. Um, I think it was 1950, this. Um, 1950. Some time around then, anyway. Um, and I thought we'd just have a quick look at some photos of, of it. The old-fashioned police car, the Bobby on the beat, that sort of thing. There's Jack Warner, who obviously played the lead character, um, and he then later on played Dixon of Doc Green, which was this um, amazing television series, Evening All. Do you remember that? Um, who else was in the film? Dirk Bogart was uh, one of the gangsters, uh, a young lad, who were tr chancing their luck on their own, doing petty crime, and it goes wrong. A, he accidentally shoots a policeman, and then all hell breaks loose. I won't tell you more than that if you've not seen it, uh, because it's an iconic film. Um, and here is Jack Warner in his old Bobby's outfit doing good old-fashioned policing work. And I miss that. I don't know about you... I miss that, seeing the, the, the local Bobby on the beat who used to know everybody. And that was the sort of crux of the film, really. It was demonstrating how the police were, yes, they were there as a, um, a deterrent, of course, but they were also there to serve you. And I don't know whether that is really uh, so true these days. Bernard Lee young Bernard Lee there, who was in many, many English films. Uh, one of the classics that I was showing on my um, channel not so long ago was Whistle Down the Wind, in which he played the farmer uh, on the farm in which um, the stranger came that Hayley Mills and the other children found in that wonderful film. And, um, and there's another picture of uh, Dirk Bogart. And then the other thing was... I love about these 1950s films is you still see, uh, not in this particular scene, but you still see the worn, the war um, relic, the war strewn um, scenery of London after the Second World War, the bombed out streets and things. But here, look at that, the lack of traffic and very little um, furniture on the roads, you know, street furniture and things. Uh, absolutely beautiful uh, to see. And when you see the film, there's a chase sequence. There's barely any cars, barely anybody on the road. It's, a, it's just an, a fascinating time to, to look back at. Here's another picture here of those empty streets and those houses. Um, now, it may be that one is going back feeling a bit nostalgic about all of this. That may be true. But um, I, there's just something about that whole era that speaks to me of a simpler time than the overpopulated world that we live in today. And sometimes you just lose yourself in these old films. If you've got a favourite old film and you'd like to recommend it, do recommend it to me. Richard at Vobes.com is the email address. Just think of my name, Richard at Vobes.com. Still need to make a little strap that comes up um, so that you can remember that a bit easier. But that, I think, is um, it's just so lovely. Those old films, um, those old black and white films, they just say something of a of a time of a certain innocence that uh, we, I often feel that we've lost. You may not. You may disagree. You may say, no, 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 Richard, we mustn't look back. Nostalgia is a bad thing. 
but I, I don't know about that. Um, now, I wanted to show you some books that have been sent in. Now, the first one I'm going to show you, which is uh, by one of my lovely viewers, Anne Wright sent this in. Now, you may remember I was telling you about a murder story, the Arundel murder, and I was showing you and telling you about that. I finished that over the weekend. Absolutely brilliant uh, book. And I want to go back when the weather at the moment is blowing a hooey outside um, and uh, to go to Arundel where this took place and have a stalk around and maybe just sort of poke about and show you some of the some of the elements that came out from that book would be quite fun, but can't do it at the moment. And Anne Wright, um, not Anne Wright, what am I talking about? That's that, that, coming on to you, Anne. Uh, Audrey Forbes, I beg your pardon, Audrey Forbes Hamilton, not her real name, clearly. Um, but Audrey sent in, she said, as you like this, I've, re I've recently read about seven years ago another book, which is a, 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 a did he or didn't he do it murder. But this actually is set in Scotland, um, Achai, the new land. And this, of course, is made in England, so I uh, shouldn't really put it in as such, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. This is a book. I don't know if anyone's read this. It's called His Bloody Project. It is a piece of fiction I've uh, been looking at because I wondered if it was true, but it won the... Um, or it was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize in 2016. Uh, I have no more knowledge than that, other than that the year is 1869, a brutal triple murder in the remote community in the Scottish Highlands leads to the arrest of a young man by the name of Roderick McRae. Uh, so I'm interested to read that. I'll let you know how I get on with that. Um, that does sound fascinating. But um, So thank you very much, Audrey. Just wanted to let you know that that has actually arrived. Um, the other thing was... This was Anne Wright, sorry, Anne, nearly attributed you to the wrong book. It's so e easy to get confused with all these wonderful people who watch the show. This is a history of English food. Um, so we've gone from Delia Smith, but this is a history of English food by uh, Clarissa Dixon Wright, one of the two fat ladies. And I spoke about this briefly in the vlog I did. Actually, I went out the same day as this did this morning uh, about a stew that I was cooking. And I couldn't help myself but dive straight in and start to read a little bit about it. I have another book called Taste by Kate, uh, somebody rather, Kate, M M um, anyway, I can't pr pronounce her name. Um, but same sort of thing. I think the history of food is, is essential, but this is of English food and the types of food that we ate. And I thought that would be fun to explore bits and pieces of that sort of thing going forward. If you've got a favourite dish and a recipe, do send it in. Um, we may even get down into the kitchen and try cooking it. You never know which would be good fun. So, I said we'd see a little bit of uh, Julia in the show. And um, as you know, we have a series in which we look at our fantasy house. What would you have as your English fantasy house? We've so far described a couple of rooms in it, but it's now time for another room. So let's go to our fantasy house and see uh, what Julia has up her sleeve. <laughs> So this time on the Fantasy House, we are going to go for, look for a different room. And this time, what kind of room do you reckon? I think we're going to go for a hobby room. A hobby room. Excellent. Well, um, so hobbies. Well, you've got hobbies. I've got a couple of hobbies. Yes. And so, should we start with you? Okay, let's start with me, I think. All right, I think. cool. What would be your hobby? What is your fantasy hobby room? What does it look like? What is it for? Well, my favourite hobby at the moment has to be the music. Oh, um, yes, because you play my when ukulele. I'm cleaning windows. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, a music room where I could yeah. have all of my little instruments. Oh, on the walls? On the walls, ready yeah. ready to be picked up and yeah. tuned and played. Fantastic. Because yep. in a way, you know, your uh, collective items, they're all sort of artistic, aren't they? So they when are. you've got them on the wall, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I, d I do find musical instruments to be very beautiful. Yeah. You know, they are very aesthetic. So know. how are you going to decorate the rest of the room? There they are on the wall. Well... Mandolin, violin, ukulele. Well, if I'm ever going to practice this... Uh, this, this um, uh, what's the word? I don't know. Violin. Violin. Yes. <laughs> if I'm ever going to practice my violin again, then yep. I need a soundproof room. So that's the first thing. It's got to be soundproof right. in this fantasy okay. room. Um, and it's going to it's going to be. I'm going to have one section of it lined in, you know, nice wood. Yeah. You know, and then on that wall is where all my instruments are going to be hung. Oh, okay. Yeah. So is that sort of stained wood, pine yes, yes. sort of thing, yeah, or whatever. Maybe, maybe. 
half turquoise and half painted right okay <laughs> well, no not painted um stained stained, Wood stained yeah. yeah and half okay. purple anyways um and the rest of the room is gonna have to be a a, a what a colour. A colour. Good. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad we managed to sort that. It's going to be a colour, folks. It's going to be a colour. It's going to be a colour. Well, what kind of colour? Um, purple. Yeah. Deep purple. Uh, uh, wasn't that a band? I think a mid colour. Yeah, I mid- think it was a yeah. band, wasn't it? Doesn't matter. Um, and I'm, so what furniture have you got in there? Well, in there, I'm go- I need a little writing desk so yeah. I can sit and write lyrics if right. I so desire. Yeah, of course. And um, you, you will mm-hmm, as you mm-hmm. get going. I'm sure you will. Mm-hmm. And on that needs to be obviously space for my laptop yes. so I can look up chords and stuff and a printer so I can print off Music. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Uh huh. And then. And will you have things like equipment, like sequencers, and all that sort of, you know, so you can play it back over big PA yes, speakers that's... and deafen yourself as you're. Yes, that's the next thing I'd need is a corner to have a computer, uh, which has um, some programs on it that I can um, record bits of music yeah. from my various instruments. I can see vocals. why it needs to be soundproof then, yeah. if you're playing it back at I huge volume out. in the rest of the house. And a mixing and we're desk. All going, oh no, oh no. Mixing desk and all of that so I can, yeah. you know, create my oh, own music. Oh, Dave Double Decks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, and would you have a relaxing chair in there so you can sit back, a big leather cha- chair yes, or something? Yes, I'm, I'm going to need a nice big comfy chair in there to yeah. sit back and listen to what I'm, I've created. And, and would you have a poof? Everyone a loves a nice. Oh, poof. I love a lovely, like, a lovely, lovely poof. From so you can feet put your feet back. That's yeah. right. That's right. And recline your head. Never yep, doze. Yep, yep. And I need a, a microphone in the middle with a oh, stool, you're so I can sit. Yeah. So I can and what sit kind of mic? Would you have one of those old-fashioned 1940s style? Because you can get yeah, them. Yeah, because they look so cool. With like you know, Julia on it, um, or whatever. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So that's my music. Room. And a mirror ball. No, it's a bit tacky. No, no. no. It's not that kind of music room. Not that kind of music. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, you might want to get up and dance. I'm oh, no, but a full length... No, I don't, I don't think... I don't want to mirror it in the music because, room. Because, I mean, a hobby's room is a place where you can run to escape as well from other things, isn't That's it? That's right. I mean, you know, you don't want to be sort of tied to the kitchen sink. You don't want to be tied to the kids' bedrooms. No, no, you don't no. want to be tied to the front room all the time. Sometimes you just want to escape and lose yourself. That's your right. Hobby. So it might be handy to have a, a table that I could just pull out with a cupboard in a corner that I can open up yeah. and have all my um, bits and bobs for any little crafting and any sewing that I might do. Because I'm yeah. want to get back into that. Because I know you, that I you had, had an interest in in making um, medieval dresses, and, medieval and dresses. period style clothing. Yeah. You know, the basics. And you don't want that into it. That, uh, to me, that's like, you know, a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. We have a jigsaw puzzle. And the last thing you want is to do it in the front room where all the kids can come in and go, oh, no, don't knock that over. Whereas if you've got something all pinned up, mm-hmm. you know, a medieval dress, it's all pinned up and you just don't want to sort of, well, I can't put this away. It just needs to stay here until I finish. Yeah. So I'd need one of those um, sewing mannequins. It's, I don't know what they're actually called, but it's sitting in the corner next to this cupboard. You know, yeah. The ones that you turn a little yeah. dial in it. Oh yeah, those they're quite macabre, aren't they? They are. My nan. I wouldn't want one in the bedroom. One. You know, you wake up no, in the middle no. of the night and you see this no. sort of expanding but chest. Mind going, you, mind you. Hello, nice. These things are slightly less macabre than a full mannequin. Oh, that with a head on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are much more freaky. Thanks, Doctor Who. Yeah, thanks. Yes. They, what were they? The Autons that came out of shop yeah. windows back in the day. So, uh, which room are we going in for you now? Well, for me, I'll have to be on the next one. Um, oh. uh, we will tell you about my fantasy. Sorry. My, no, no, that's good. We want to, I wanted to get all the detail on yours. Uh, your fantasy hobby room. So the next one I will address is my, and you can ask me a million questions about Yay. it. Yay. So there we go. That's our fantasy excerpt for today. Well, there we are. We'll find out what my version of my hobby room, whatever, in the next episode. Well, that's it. That's another fun-packed episode of Made in England. Hope you enjoy it and uh, aim to be back again uh, very soon, possibly tomorrow, once we've got it all formulated and all going. Of course, the English couple will be here as well. But that's it for today. Thank you so much. Look after yourselves. Have a fantastic time. And until I chat to you next time, bye-bye.